Uh, well, uh, good afternoon to uh, everyone and thank you for the opportunity to offer a few thoughts on uh, working together to address poverty in Bedfordshire. Particular thanks for those who are staying with us uh, for this after lunch session, staying with us thus far at least. Um, and should I say, I think what I've uh, got to say, my script has been to a certain extent uh, overridden by uh, the great discussion we had uh, in, in our uh, group breakout session. So do feel free to chip in along the way and don't wait for questions uh, at the end. I mean, working together, uh, I take it to mean working with all of those organisations, charities, statutory agencies whose focus is on addressing the needs of the poor, the disadvantaged, the homeless, indeed those depicted in the uh, NOAA diagram as being deprived. And I made this point uh, up front because we've recently been considering Parliament the Welfare Reform and Work, I think Stuart Etherington referred to this, and some of its early clauses were about poverty and measurements of poverty. The old uh, targets of the Child Poverty Act were swept away. I feel particularly aggrieved by that as I took that piece of legislation through the House of Lords when we were uh, in government. Uh, but indeed, uh, so were any income measures on the basis that these were symptoms of poverty and not causes. A hotly contested proposition, as you can imagine. Uh, personally, uh, I subscribe to the Child Poverty Action Group view that poverty is multifaceted and a condition marked by the absence uh, of resources, certainly affordable housing, uh, which Bill Rammel referred to uh, earlier, but some of those may not be financial. Nonetheless, an inadequate income remains the decisive characteristic of poverty and should remain central to any poverty measurement. And I hope this would guide what we do. So I would applaud the focus of this conference and those here today and beyond who toil in so many ways to address poverty and ease the burdens on our most disadvantaged fellow human beings. Efforts uh, which we've heard are particularly challenging at the current time and as others uh, have identified, and I'll come back to some of those shortly. But the effort which goes on in local communities is remarkable. Uh, I would confess to knowing Luton better than wider Bedfordshire, and I'm privileged to serve as an advisory member of the board of Luton's uh, airport company. I can see Rob again, Robin getting nervous at this, uh, this, this point. Um, but it's in this capacity that I received a copy uh, of a report on its community funding program, which has various components, but particularly a partnership fund, which is designed to provide significant and sustainable funding to organisations to help them deliver on key priorities of Luton's sustainable community strategy. Uh, I raise this matter uh, not to open up debate about who gets what, but to offer a glimpse of the range of activities and the breadth of input into our local life from so many individuals and organisations beyond the statutory sector. The activities encompass support for adopters, helping young carers, funding youth services, support to the Asian community around domestic violence, supporting young people with skills and helps them avoid in debt, parenting skills, uh, sorry, parenting skills for victims of uh, domestic uh, abuse, help with school uniforms, funding for the food bank, enabling a Luton advice uh, network, and support for the Disability Resource Centre, and many more, including, of course, uh, NOAA. Although all of this effort does not fit neatly together, it's a reflection uh, of the very best of uh, human uh, nature. And we've heard about much more in the breakout sessions as well. This is just a focus on Luton. And our community's need for all of this will grow at a time of increased challenges for our clients or residents, and where funding for us and for them will remain restricted. Most of these challenges to our clients flow from the consequence of what is popularly termed austerity. The economic and fiscal policies of the current government and its predecessor, the coalition. Uh, I know that raising this matter means we stray into the realm of politics, but I'll try and keep it away from party politics. Everyone knows that we need as a country to address the levels of debt on our annual deficit, and we may have differing views as to how we ended up uh, where we are. Now, there is not just one way to do it, of course, but as a practical matter, 
it seems we have to accept that what has gone, what has gone before and what is planned for the rest of this parliament, even though we may not like it. The uh, IFS has undertaken an analysis of the tax and benefit policies of the coalition government and concluded that over the five years there were tax rises net of 13.5 billion and spending reductions net, a net in particular of five billion pound of pensioner increases of 16.6 billion. And in terms of the distribution of this, it showed that measured as, measured as a percentage of income, the bottom two percentiles contributed the most. Measured in cash terms, the greatest burden was borne by the top percentile and then the bottom two percentiles. So by and large, the poorest, including our clients, are paying the price of austerity. And a similar pattern is emerging under the current government, which is already legislating for cuts to annual spending on working age benefits and tax credits of 12 billion a year by 2020. These are to be delivered largely via the Welfare and Work Bill, and by de definition, that they will hit the poorest. I mean, some of the measures include reductions in the benefit cap, but total amount of benefits that the workless family can claim is to be cut from 26,000 to 20,000 pounds a year outside London, 23,000 inside London. Of course, the Secretary of State is given power to amend that cap in the future without reference to any specific criteria. As will be recognised, the cap is currently operated by a reduction in housing benefit and it's inevitably most affected people in London because of the high rates. But the lowering of the cap will have significant consequences for places like Luton and indeed uh, Bedford, where renting for a family with two children in the private sector could easily cost 200 to 250 pounds a week, uh, putting a strain on the available amount uh, under the cap. Discretionary housing payments uh, referred to by my noble friend Baroness Lister in the Lords as the Loaves and Fishes Fund, uh, notwithstanding that uh, there is the looming prospect of rising debt, rising evictions and more homelessness. Not made any easier with London boroughs visiting some of their caseload on us. However, we were successful at Ireland in getting the government to agree that recipients of carers allowance uh, would be exempt from the benefit cap. The bill also includes a four-year freeze on working age benefits, but not those benefits which relate to the additional costs of disability, DIA, uh, PIP, etc. This freeze comes on top of child benefit being frozen in cash terms for two years and then uprated by just 1%. And this freeze has obvious consequences for poverty, and indeed yesterday's Guardian referred to a report from the Children's Society which concluded that more than 7 million children living in low-income households would be affected by the freeze, with many more being pushed into poverty. Luton, Bedford and indeed Central Beds will not be unaffected by this. But we are separately to have a freeze of the local housing allowance, which will mean for areas where there is housing pressure and rising rents in the private sector, there will be a growing gap between the rents and levels of uh, housing benefit. There are other provisions on hold uh, whereby social rents are to be reduced by 1% a year for four years, and there will be a cap on the level of housing benefit set at the uh, LHA level. Now, rent reduction might sound like uh, good news, but for most it will simply be offset by less uh, housing benefit. The major concern is what it means for the income flows for housing revenue accounts and housing associations, and in particular, their ability to provide specialist accommodation for elderly <coughs> people, hostels, refuges, uh, refugees. Um, and in response to pressure, the government did defer these measures and is undertaking a review. But we're aware that some housing associations are holding back on projects which are in the pipeline. I don't know whether this will affect any planned projects in Bedford, but we know uh, that I think St Mungo's, that somebody referred to earlier, but particularly exercised by this. There are just two other matters I would raise in this context. The first relates to the removal 
of the top-up payment of approximately £30 a week for disabled people in the ESA work-related activity year group. That is, those who've been assessed as not fit for work, but who should undertake work-related activity in an effort to move closer to the labour market. It does not affect people in the support group, the most disabled. It was argued, but hotly disputed, that the £30 a week is a <coughs> incentive for them to uh, work. The proposition seems to be that the bigger the gap between what you can get in work and what you can get in benefits uh, encourages more people into work. If you take that to its logical conclusion, you would do away with benefits uh, altogether. Um, the proposal uh, in respect of this £30 was defeated at our end, but I suspect by the time uh, I'm delivering this speech today, it will have been overturned in the Commons. There is, as we know, a big gap in the employment rate between disabled, uh, who of course are not a homogeneous group, and non-disabled people, and it has remained stubbornly so through a number of political administrations. The government has made laudable commitments uh, to halve this gap and to make progress on this during this Parliament. Limited extra funding has been made available and we're promised a white paper shortly. We must use this chance to engage so that our experiences and that of our clients is brought to bear. And so to the two-child policy, the most disagreeable aspect of the legislation. Entitlement to child tax credit for a third and subsequent child born after the 6th of April 2017 is to be removed. Uh, the government had planned some exemptions from the policy for multiple births um, and rape, and also accepted amendments covering adoption. But the basic provisions remain. And how on earth uh, um, what evidence is going to have to be provided and to who would be the DWP in respect to births arising from rape? We could discuss this forever, I'm sure, but one clear concern for us is that the risks of child poverty are already significantly higher among larger families and will be exacerbated by this. The nature of our local communities should heighten our concern. So much of the foregoing will make life more difficult for us and for those we seek to support. But in, uh, in case it's thought I've been unfair to the government, that uh, we should welcome the progress they've made on employment, the <coughs> growth in zero hours contracts, on a national living wage, although we see the challenges that that presents to the charitable and voluntary sector, on tax cuts indeed for those who earn enough, and on vesting in the NHS, although much of this is to do with the need of a growing uh, demographic. And we should also recognise there has been uh, support given to pensions. So far as LBC is concerned, it's appropriate, I think, to look at the council and the airport resources as one for uh, this purpose. We know, and I think the budget for next year was actually set on uh, Monday, that it's had to endure horrendous cuts uh, in support from central government. Being a council which has relatively low council tax base and a relatively high grant base, it suffers from the thrust of austerity uh, more than some uh, surrounding authorities although they're certainly not immune from the cuts uh, either. Uh, in its uh, press release, uh, LBC stated that since 2013-14, the amount of funding from government has reduced by 55%, and the council is expecting its revenue support grant to reduce by a further 28 million over the next four years. This inevitably makes it more difficult to, in aggregate, support the range of community activity we've known in the past, and indeed for the Council's own direct uh, provision. It should be applauded for attaining full Council tax reduction for low-income families with a disabled member in the household, even if it's had to bring some low-income families into charge. Uh, we cannot look to the Council for our salvation, but we should recognise the value of continued but mutual dependency in addressing our shared aims. So what can we do about all of this? The incumbent <coughs> in me wanted to map this all out to see where the overlaps and gaps in provision were and to contemplate a rigorous rationalisation of the voluntary and charity section, uh, sector. But of course life is not like this. 
Many in the sector have a particular ethos, approach or motivation, which for some might be quite personal. It might be a deep religious conviction or a life experience which motivates their engagement. They cannot be bundled up and transferred around a system uh, to somebody's whim. Indeed, rationalisation might make it more difficult for traditional funders to continue to support certain activities if they are subsumed into a broader entity. And how might our clients feel? I'm bound to say, since I wrote that and participated in the discussion group earlier, I questioned whether that was uh, too negative an assessment of where we might be. And indeed, there might be more scope uh, for some uh, rationalisation or joining together in the sector. Uh, this all begs the question which we're here to address. How should we be working better together to address poverty in our local area? So, a few thoughts of my own. Uh, where are remit supports it? We can do more, can we do more, to work with the, the grain of the government, both locally and nationally? We know that the focus of the latter is to get people into work, as they consider this the best route out of poverty, good for health, and an indicator of future prosperity. Whilst in-work poverty is growing and a concerning phenomenon, there is a broad consensus, I think, a broad political consensus, which supports the proposition that to work is good for one's health, work is generally a good route to out of poverty. For the benefit of our clients, and not the glory of the government, is there more that we can do to help those clients for which it's appropriate into work? And what and how would we have to reconfigure our support to do this? Because whatever we do, it must always have our clients as, it fo as its focus. They should be the cause, not us. But we might do more as organisations to know each other better, understand our separate, possibly different client approaches, and be prepared to work jointly where necessary. Indeed, uh, how often would we seek to refer, with their agreement, of course, a client to another uh, organisation? I'm bound to say there were some heartening views expressed on this uh, in the breakout group I attended. We're in an environment where the benefit system is changing significantly. And it's not only the individual measures, some of which I've set out above, but the eventual wholesale replacement of six benefits by the universal credit. This benefit is gradually being rolled out, and its final destination has been a bit of a movable feast. Staying up to date, and making the best of the benefit network will be important. I'm not familiar enough with the advice network to appreciate its capacity, but keeping abreast of these benefit changes will be vital. There's another matter too I think referred to in this morning's sessions. We know that the application of sanctions has been a key driver of poverty and recourse to food banks. So is there more we can do to make use of the expertise available, especially given the demise of legal aid, to prevent our clients falling foul of some of the conditionality which is in the benefit system. This would be a very direct way of addressing poverty. And we should not eschew some consideration of whether we can get more for less from the resources which are available to us as individual organisations. Although, when we get to counting the paper clips, that we know the end is nigh. But we owe it to our clients to make best use of the money which is available to us. Not a new idea, but is there scope, possibly via a social enterprise, to share some more back office facilities, including maybe transport arrangements? I'm conscious that much of what I've said has been from a loosened focus. But we know that poverty does not begin at the boundaries of Luton. It exists in Bedford, in rural areas, in central Bedfordshire areas too. And these boundaries must not be practical boundaries to our working together, to sharing good practice. Nor should they be barriers to our joining up more formally, if this is in the interests of our clients. We have huge challenges ahead of us uh, and big responsibilities too. We're very happy to answer any questions.